Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. I'd like to welcome you all here today, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Are You Embracing the Jordan River? I'll say it again. Are you embracing the Jordan River? And scripture mentions the Jordan River a number of times. And in the Hebrew, that name Jordan, it means to flow down or descend. And the Jordan River, or otherwise known as the River Jordan, it's 251 kilometers long. It's a river in the Middle East that flows roughly north to south and through the Sea of Galilee onto the Dead Sea. Did you hear that? The Sea of Galilee onto the Dead Sea. And according to the Oxford Bible Dictionary, the Jordan River is the most important river located in Palestine, and it rises in three sources. The first one, it issues as a stream from a cave. It's joined by two great springs as well, and then also a fountain from a place called Hasbea flows into it. And Hasbea is located high up near Mount Hermon. And we know of Mount Hermon, we read of that in the scripture of Psalm 133 verse 3, as the Jew of Hermon and as the Jew that descends upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commands the blessing, even life evermore. Praise God. So the Jordan River makes its way down through the Sea of Galilee onto the Dead Sea. And throughout its journey, the Jordan River has many threatening rapids, as well as many other rapids to a lesser magnitude. And it's fringed with a thicket of trees, shrubs, willows, among which lions lurk. Also, when the Jordan River floods, snakes come out of their holes. So in the time of flooding, that's when there's a lot of water, everything that is hidden gets washed out into the open. Meanwhile, the Jordan Valley is, between, is below the sea level and it produces significant crops. And the fullness of the Jordan River, when it overflows its banks, occurs during the time of harvest. And that's usually between March and April in the warm uh, valley. And it's produced by the melting of the snow of Mount Hermon. And wherever the Jordan River flows, it brings life. And Jordan itself is a fertile valley. So throughout this topic, we're going to review a number of people whose lives were impacted by the Jordan River. And the first mention of Jordan is regarding to Lot, who was Abraham's nephew. So I'm just going to open my King James Bible to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. And we read here in verses 1 and 2. <coughs> and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. Verse 5 and 6, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herbs and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. Verses 7 to 9, it says, And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee and between thy herd, my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt go to the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if you depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Verses 10 and 11, it says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest into Zoar. And Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. You know, God is not into strife. Strife is not of God. And neither was Abraham. Because of the Lord's blessing, there needed to be a separation between Abraham and Lot. So Abraham graciously suggested Lot choose where he would like to dwell. And verses 12 and 13, it says, And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Abraham gave Lot the free choice. And then on account of the fertility of the land of the Jordan Valley, Lot chose the plain of Jordan because of its rich agricultural potential. However, and unfortunately, where Lot settled was not too far from Sodom. And, when it, and where you put your eyes is where your heart is and where you will go. And so before too long, Lot relocated into the city of Sodom. And then because of the wickedness there in this city, Lot's heart was vexed. And vexed means it was grieved and tormented. And I'm just going to read a scripture. Speaking of Lot, it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And the Amplified says, for that just man, this is Lot, living there among them, tortured his righteous soul every day with what he saw and heard of their unlawful and wicked deeds. And we know from scripture that because Lot left the fertile plains of Jordan to live in Sodom, life was very challenging and grievous for Lot. And as believers, we need to remain at Jordan and not dwell or set up camp around the ungodly. All right, the next person is Moses and natural Israel. Moses led natural Israel to the Jordan River and Moses gave natural Israel God's instructions. Just turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. And we just read here in verse 1. And the Lord says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. And then down in verses 11, ch sorry, chapter 11, and verse 22 to 25, it says here, For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourself. Did you hear the prerequisite there? He said, if they will love the Lord, God will sort out their enemies. Verse 24, and every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall be your coast. And there shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon as he has said unto you. And just down to verses 31 and 32, it says, For you shall pass over Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you shall possess it and dwell therein. And you shall observe to do all the statutes and judgments which I set before you this day. And then chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, it says, And these are the statutes and the judgments which you shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of your fathers gives thee to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains, upon the hills, and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars and break down their pillars 
and burn their groves with fire, and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. You know, God did not want natural Israel to learn or practice false, ungodly ways. And verses 10 to 11, it says here, But when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about you so that you dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heave offerings of your hand and all your choice vows which you vow unto the Lord. Praise God. God has a place with his name on it and he has a place for every believer to be planted in. And chapter 27, chapter 27, verse 1 to 4, it says here, And Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day, and it shall be on the day when you pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law when thou art passed over, that thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, a land that flows with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee. All right, natural Israel, they wrote the law on natural stones. However, today, as believers, we are living stones and God is writing his law on the fleshy tables of our heart. And as believers, the land that flows with milk and honey speaks of the word of God. Milk speaks of the word of God for spiritual babies. And honey speaks of revelation of God's word. And as believers, the land shall be filled with milk and honey. As believers, we're made of the dust of the, dust of the earth. And so we need to embrace the milk and the honey of God's word. Our land needs to flow with milk and honey. And God's word is a promised land. And also, I'll just, um, I'll read it. It's Revelation chapter 10, verse 9 to 10. The apostle John wrote, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, my belly was bitter. This is the little book. God wants us to eat, digest it, write it on our hearts. Praise God. Praise God. And so we need to be hungry for God's word. And when we receive revelation of God's word, it is sweet. We go, oh, I get understanding from that scripture. And it's terrific, isn't it? However, then comes the testings and trials in our lives which cause us to be fortified within and that and they develop godly fruit character praise god there's purpose in everything that god does and deuteronomy chapter 31 verses 1 and 2 and moses went and spake these words unto the children of israel and he said unto them i am 120 years old this day I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord has said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Right? Moses, although a great leader, he knew of the promised land on the other side of Jordan. However, he personally was not going to experience it. And verses 7 and 8, that says, And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that does go before you, he will be with you, he will not fail you, neither forsake you, fear not, neither be dismayed. That means discouraged. All right, so then we have Joshua. Joshua and natural Israel crossed Jordan. So let's turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. It says here, 
Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. You know, every generation in the Bible is exhorted to press into God and his word. And as believers, we are to take hold of every promise in God's word because God's word is full of promises and it is the promised land as well as heaven when we get there. All right. There's promises in God's word. And every time you, you get hold of and you take it and you understand it and he writes it in your heart, it's yours. That's how you take the land every time you get that understanding. And verses 5 to 9, it says here, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which my servant Moses commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and thou and then thy soul shall have good success and verse 9 have not i commanded thee be strong and of good courage be not afraid neither be now thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whithersoever thou goest praise god and verses 10 and 11 it says then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days, you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. And then Joshua chapter three it says here in one to three. And Joshua rose early in the morning and they moved from Shittim and came to Jordan he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. The ark of the covenant, it speaks of God and his presence. And as believers, we need to go after, we need to seek after to be in the presence of the Lord. And, you know, even Jesus said, follow me. All right. And as believers, we are to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. And verse four, it says, and yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. So God was taking them in a new direction. They'd not been that way before. And it just said um, that the, there was going to be 2,000 cubits. The ark was going to go ahead 2,000 cubits. And in scripture, a cubit symbolizes one year. So 2,000 cubits symbolize 2,000 years. And Jesus, of course, he's the ark of God. He went into heaven 2,000 years ahead of the end time church. Praise God. And verse eight. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant saying, when you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. So the priests were to stand still in Jordan, those carrying the ark. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant were required to stand still in in Jordan and the Jordan River river can be very turbulent and as priests leaders we need to be able to stand still in Jordan regardless of the opposition 
And the Jordan River at that time was flowing. And then God did a miracle. Verse 13 to 17, it says, And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it shall come to pass when the people remove from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water that Jordan overflowed its banks all the time of harvest. That the waters which came down from above stood up and rose up in a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zaratan and those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and there were cut off and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the law stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Hallelujah. They passed over on dry ground. God just made the waters to stop flowing and they went on dry ground, not even soggy ground or a little bit of water. They went on dry, like absolutely a miracle of God. And there is nothing impossible with God. Hallelujah. And Joshua chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, but let's see what happens. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, Take you 12 men out of the people, out of, what, out of every tribe, so one from each tribe, a man, and command you then, take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. All right, so they're going to get 12 stones out of the midst of Jordan and put them on the other side. Verse 4, And then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man you a stone upon his shoulder, ascending unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Praise God. And so scripture shows, we know in another place there, that the high priest... In the tabernacle, when he was in his attire, he had six stones on each shoulder. And six plus six equals 12. And the number 12 represents government. And it was a prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Because Jesus is our high priest. And on his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. And just while we're here in this passage, regarding the city of God, it has 12 foundation stones. I'll just read it. It says, Revelation 21, verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So God's church is built on the foundation of, of the apostles doctrine and meanwhile a natural river tumbles the stones in it and these 12 stones were taken out of the midst of Jordan and these 12 stones had been smoothed they'd been proven they'd withstood all the testing of the Jordan River and so and the number 12 speaks of the apostles and the apostles' doctrine. In Joshua chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, it says here, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, what do you mean by these stones? Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan, and the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. 
and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Praise God. And then we read in verses 9 and 10, And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan. Right, so they've taken 12 out, and they're also setting up 12 in the midst of Jordan. Until everything was finished, and the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Praise God. And then down in verses 16 to 20, it says here, And command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. And Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and it flowed over all his banks as that did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and it camped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. All right, so there's another miracle. As soon as all the people had passed over Jordan, all the waters came back. Praise God. And, the, and then the 12 that they took out, the 12 stones, were then put in a place called Gilgal. And Gilgal means a stone circle or a circle of stones. So here's these 12 stones, all right? And then verse 21 to 24, it says, And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, what mean these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord, that's reverence the Lord, your God forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like we know we have memorials these days and they put up stones or things so that people remember. Well, that's what they were doing back then. They put these stones and so that anybody and that all those other generations will know this was what a miracle God did. These stones came out of a river that was overflowing. God caused it to stop flowing and the people went over on dry land. Hallelujah. And, you know, we must never forget God's miracles. He does things for us during our walk with him. And, you know, people, can, it's so easy to forget God or, or get distracted from God. But we need to remember the good things. And so sometimes vi visual things remind us of the things God does. All right, we're going to look at a man called Gideon over into Judges, the next book. Judges, chapter 7. The situation was that natural Israel were being intimidated by their enemy, the Midianites. And God chose Gideon to lead natural Israel to victory. Natural Israel's army consisted of 32,000 people. However, God told Gideon to send those who were afraid to go home. And 22,000 people went home. And that left 10,000 people. And God then brought the people down to the river to see how they would drink the water. And Judges chapter 7, verses 5 to 7. So he brought down the people unto the water. So this is the 10,000 people. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that laps of the water with his tongue as a dog laps, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink water. And verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand and let all the other people go, every man under his place. All right, so there was a separation here at the river. And some people were going to get down on all fours like a dog and lap and others were going to bring the water with their hand to their mouth. And as believers, what does the water speak of? The word of God. And what does the hand speak of? God's fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And we need to be thirsty for the word of God. 
if we desire victory in our lives. In verse 8 it says, So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. The trumpet also speaks of the word of God. In verse 16, and it says, And, this, and Gideon divided the 300 men into three companies, that's a hundred and a hundred and a hundred. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. Again, the trumpet speaks of the word of God and the lamp, of course, speaks of the word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now the pitchers, they were like, um, like pots, I guess, pots. They were to be broken and empty and that means as believers we need to be broken and empty of self so the light of God inside us will shine and also the trumpet and the lamp together speak of a double portion trumpet and the lamp double portion of the word of God hallelujah and verse 17, let's go read on to 22. Hallelujah. Verse 17. And Gideon said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that you do as I do, shall you do. And when I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon, the hundred men that were with him, came into the outside of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And they had newly set watch and they blew the trumpets and they break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpet in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittar in Zerareth and to the border of Abel Mahaloa unto Tabith. Praise God. Hallelujah. When did it take place? The midnight watch, which speaks of the midnight hour, which we are in. And they all blew their trumpets, the word of God, at the same time. And the enemy was defeated. And God's army needs to have a double portion of the word of God, which will be fully declared in the midnight hour. Hallelujah. And also they, they will be able to stand in their place. And that other scripture says, having done all, stand. And the enemy shall be defeated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the fleeing Midianites, they crossed Jordan when being chased by Gideon and his army. Just down to verse 23 to 25, it says, And Gideon sent messages throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters under Beth Barah, and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zerub, Zeb, and they also slew Oreb upon the rock and rock Oreb and, and Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. In chapter 8, verse 4, it says here, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing them. And verse 28, it says, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy was totally defeated. But he didn't, God didn't use the big multitude. He used those that had been separated, prepared and, and obeyed God, had the, 
and bathe the instructions and they were hungry and drinking from the hand. They were people that were equipped with the word of God. Hallelujah. All right, next one is Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet of God and that Elijah, the name Elijah, means Jehovah is my God. I'm just going to turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. And verse 1 to 6, it says here, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, sent unto Ahab, As the Lord of God of Israel, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. So Elijah just spoke it out. There's not going to be rain for these years. But according to my word, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook, Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. I mean, it's a time of famine. I don't know where the ravens got the food, but they did. God can do anything. Verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook and it came and drank of the brook. And, you know, Elijah knew what it was to dwell by the brook Cherith near Jordan. He was by a brook. And that word Cherith, it means to cut off or cut down. And the name also signifies to engrave or carve. It's a cutting. It's a separation. It's a gorge. It's a torrent bed and a, or a winter stream. So it's a real lot of dealings going on there. And Cherith is a place where God withholds perhaps what you want most. It's about God's will for your life. It's a place of separation. And verse 7 to 9, it says here, And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. And Zarephath means ambush of the mouth. Verse 10 and 12. And it says here, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and he said, Fetch me. I pray thee a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I, that I, am, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. So she's just saying, she, what, she's saying we're going to eat this and we're going to die. Like out, the words out of her mouth, you know, our words are powerful and we know that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So we need to speak words that agree with God's word, words that are uplifting, life-giving. And verse 13 to 16, it says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, Go and do as thou hast said, but make me a little cake first and bring it into me and after make for, thy, for thee and thy son. And thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah and she and her and her house did eat many days and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So the widow woman, what did she do? She obeyed the word of God, the word of the Lord. And then, because of her obedience, she experienced a wonderful miracle of God's provision. What a wonderful example. 
And so for the next three years, listen to it, for the next three years, Elijah ministers to a congregation of two people. One's the widow and one's her son. You know, there are many churches these days with thousands and thousands of people. And here's the prophet of God, the man of God, ministering just to two people. And, you know, we must never despise the day of small things. And not only is God the author, he's also the finisher of all things. Hallelujah. And then in the third year, if, if we know the story, God used Elijah to destroy all the false prophets because there's a lot of rubbish. Back then, there was a lot of rubbish going on. And it's no different today. And to turn the hearts of natural Israel back to God. And that's all true ministries do is turn the hearts of people to God. And then God used Elijah to cause it to rain. Let's turn over to chapter 18 and verse 41 to 46. It says here, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the east, and he went up and looked and said, well, there is nothing. And he said, go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there rises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, get up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab robed and went to Jez, Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Hallelujah. Elijah, he heard a sound of an abundance of rain and rain speaks of the word of God and we need to have spiritual ears that hear God's word. And where was, um, there was a cloud coming up? The sea, it speaks of nations. It says in Revelation 17, verse 15, and he said unto me, the waters which thou seest, where the horse sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. All right? Hallelujah. And so, and it, how many times did the servant have to go? Seven times. And seven times speaks of completeness and fullness, as well as the end times which you are now in. Hallelujah. And again, rain speaks of the word of God. And so there's going to be a fullness of the word of God coming throughout the earth. Hallelujah. And the cloud that was in the shape of a hand speaks again of the fivefold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, who will bring a great rain, a great rain, which is a double portion of the word of God. Hallelujah. And it's God's word that's going to bring a unity in the body of Christ. It's not going to be of man doing it. God is going to bring about a unity using his word throughout every nation. Praise God. For those that have got a heart for the truth. Praise God. And having ears to hear. How many times did Jesus say, you that have ears that hear, hear. Not with your natural ears, but with your spiritual ears in your heart. We need those spiritual ears hearing God's word. The next one is Elisha. And it was Elijah that found Elisha. And the name Elisha means God is my salvation. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 to 21, so Elijah departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12th and Elijah passed by with him and cast his mantle upon him. And Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said, Elijah said to him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? And Elisha, he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh 
with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. All right. Oxen speak of apostles. Twelve oxen speak of the apostles doctrine. And he had 12 yoke. So a yoke is two. So 12 yokes equals 24. And there are 24 around the throne. In the book of Revelation, it says Revelation 4 verse 4. And round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw the four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Hallelujah. And Elisha, he followed Elijah wholeheartedly. And Elisha left his livelihood and he followed Elijah and ministered unto him. You know, remember when time of Jesus, Jesus just looked at people and he just said, follow me. And they just dropped the Peter, the fisherman, the taxman, the um, different ones, the 12 apostles. They just dropped what they were doing and went after Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. Because time went on and then uh, and it says chapter 2 verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And again, Gilgal is that place of stone, circle stone or a circle of stones. And verse 2. And Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said to him, As the Lord lives and as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. Verse 3. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, yeah, yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. So the prophets at Bethel, they spoke truly to Elisha about what was going to happen to Elijah. Verse four. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, like stay at Bethel, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said unto, and he said, as the Lord lives and as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And Jericho means the place of fragrance. So there's a moving on here. There's a moving, a desiring more and more of God. Verse 5. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. So the prophets at Jericho spoke truly to Elisha about what was going to happen to Elijah. Verse 6, And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord, as the Lord liveth has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, so this is Elisha answering, As the Lord lives and as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. Again, Elisha, he would not leave Elijah's side. And this time they were going to Jordan. And verse 7, and the 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. The Amplified says, verse 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood to watch afar off, and the two of them, which is Elijah and Elisha, stood by the Jordan. And the number 50 always speaks of Pentecost, because Pentecost 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. And so these 50 prophets, they stood to view afar off and watch. However, they were not willing to go to Jordan. They were just up on the hill watching. And they camped. And I'll say it this way, they remained at Pentecost. And to understand this further, natural Israel celebrated three feasts. Feast of Passover, which speaks of salvation. Feast of Weeks, or otherwise known as Feast of Pentecost, which speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But there's a third feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And it speaks of the ingathering, 
and within that third feast there'll be the blowing of trumpets the word of God to feed the church with the word of God the marriage of the lamb the great in gathering and the dwelling in booths praise God so there is a third feast which all believers need to go after and be part of don't just settle in salvation don't just settle in Pentecost have in your heart Lord I want everything I want to go all the way like Elisha I want to go all the way and then verse 8 it says and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters and they were divided hither and thither so the two went over on dry ground <laughs> here we are at Jordan again smiting the water going over on dry ground amazing what a miracle and verses 9 to 10 and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee and Elisha said I pray thee let a double portion of the of thy spirit be upon me and he and Elijah said and if that thou has asked thou has asked a hard thing nevertheless if you see me when I am taken from thee it shall be so unto thee but if not it shall not be so and Elisha he desired the double portion and so he needed to be close to Elijah and be watching Elisha was not spiritually asleep and for us as believers we need to be awake and do we desire the double portion hallelujah and verses 11 and 12 it says and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up in the whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it and he cried my father my father the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof and he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces a transfer of ministry takes place at the Jordan River verse 13 to 14 and he took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said where is the Lord God of Elijah and when he also had smitten the waters they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over here he is going on dry ground again praise God another miracle praise God Elisha he was empowered at the Jordan River and verse 15 and when the sons of the prophets which were to view him at Jericho saw him they said the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha and they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him you know the prophets recognized Elijah's Elisha's ministry and submitted themselves to him and then Elisha well, he went forward in his ministry and he performed twice as many miracles as did Elijah praise God all right there's just a few more to do uh, Naaman the captain of the Syrian army second Kings chapter 5 and verse 1 it says now Naaman captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria he was also a mighty man in valor but he was a leper verse 2 to 4 it says and the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away brought away a captive out of the land a little maid and she waited on Naaman's wife and she said to her mistress would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria for he would recover him of his leprosy and one went in and told his Lord and saying thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel and in verse 5 to 8 it says and the king of Syria said go go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel and he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment and he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying now when this letter is come unto thee behold I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy so here's this letter going to the king saying well can you just uh, heal him and then the king says in verse um, 
7. And it came to pass when the king of Israel heard the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. Just misinterpreted it. And verse 8. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent his king, saying, Wherefore hast thou sent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. All right, let's just verse 9 on. And so Naaman came with his horse and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away angry and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come unto me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, his God, and, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfur river of Damascus better than all these waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Wow. The situation revealed, you know, the pride in Naaman's heart. You know, Naaman thought that Elisha should have come out and seen him himself. And rather, he sent a messenger. And so now he became really, really angry. You know, angry is not a fruit of the spirit, is it? He became angry. And also he did not desire to wash in that dirty old Jordan. <laughs> that river, that Jordan River. He'd, uh, there were other rivers he'd prefer to wash in. He had his own ideas about how everything was supposed to take place. That's rooted in pride. And verse 13, it says here, And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he says unto thee, Wash and be clean. Fortunately, Naaman humbled himself and obedience prevailed. And verse 14, And then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So Naaman, who had leprosy, after he'd washed seven times in Jordan, was healed, and his flesh was made clean. And again, seven is the number for completeness and fullness. And Naaman had to wash. And what did he wash in? The Jordan River. Water. So as believers, when we wash our flesh in the water of God's word, our flesh will become clean. And also when we receive and believe God's word of healing, we will be healed. Hallelujah. All right, into the New Testament. John the Baptist. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, it says here, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him to, of Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And just as a natural river gives life, so to the Jordan River, after we bury our old our old life through water baptism. We then rise to walk in newness of life as a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. And as a believer, if you haven't been water baptized, I would encourage you to bury your old life. It puts a separation of your old life so that your new life goes forward in God. Praise God. And we also we read in what John the Baptist says in chapter 3, verse 30. Chapter 3. Oh, John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 30. And verse 30, it says, 
And speaking of Jesus, he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And the Amplified says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must grow more prominent and I must grow less so. I, 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 me, 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 grow less so. All right. And also the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, at the end of that, I die daily. I die daily. Self has to be put down so that the life of God comes forward. And what else did John the Baptist say? Just Matthew chapter 3 again. Matthew 3 and verse 8. And John the Baptist said, Bring forth therefore fruits Meet for repentance. The Amplified says, bring forth fruit that is consistent with repentance. Let your lives prove your change of heart. True repentance brings change to one's life. Hallelujah. And verse 11, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Also, the word of God, as we read it, receive it, it causes pricking in our heart and causes us to repent of things that we know are not suitable before God. Praise God. Meanwhile, John the Baptist, who was he talking about? Who was referring to that would come after him? The one that was coming after him? Jesus. Hallelujah. So John the Baptist, he came in the power of Elijah the prophet. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest prophet born of women. God used John the Baptist to turn all natural Israel to God. One man. It's never been about numbers. It's always been about hearts to turn all Israel. Praise God. And then Jesus, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, it says here, Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water and lo, the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hallelujah. Jesus was without sin. So why did he go to Jordan? Why did he go to be baptized? At Jordan, there was a transfer of priesthood from the Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood. Praise God. And we read of Jesus' ministry, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Because Jesus received the Holy Spirit, and truly God wants all believers to receive the Holy Spirit, it's the empowerment to walk the walk. It says, verse, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, well, how much more do we? Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Praise God. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and everywhere he went, he brought life lives changed for the better hallelujah and jesus said in john chapter 7 john chapter 7 verse 38 and 39 jesus said he that believes on me as the scripture has said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This says rivers out of your belly shall flow rivers. And I believe that rivers is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Yes, but also the word of God. Hallelujah. Coming up. Holy Spirit brings the word of God back to our remembrance. 
and I'm just going to turn to it quickly. Psalm 1, it says, verses 1 to 3, Blessed, would you like to be blessed? This is how it is. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the seat of the sinners, in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the, sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Well, believers are likened to trees, and when trees are planted by the rivers of water, they will bring forth fruit in their season. Hallelujah. Praise God. And it says in... Um, I'll just turn to James chapter 5, verse 7. Hallelujah. James 5, verse 7. And it says here, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband, that's the father, God the Father, waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he, the earth, receives the early and latter rain. Again, rain speaks of the word of God. So the early rain speaks of the Old Testament and the latter rain speaks of the New Testament. And we are to delight ourselves in the word of God day and night and so bring forth much fruit. Amen. Amen. And, and so Jordan also speaks of death to self. And regarding Jesus, he said in Luke 22 verse 42, um, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, Jesus had a free will, but he willingly chose to yield himself to his Father's will. You know, is that our heart? Is that our desire? You know, not my will, but God the Father's will for our lives? Hope so. Praise God. And just the last section, Ezekiel. We read a prophecy, Ezekiel 47 after Jeremiah there, Ezekiel 47. And this prophecy covers a period of time being 4,000 years and it's shown in four measurements of 1,000 cubits. Verse 1 and 2. And afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house and behold the waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward to the forefront of the house towards the east and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out to the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without <laughs> unto the utter gate by the way that looks eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. East always speaks of God's presence. In verse 3. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and he brought me forth the waters, through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Again, a cubit speaks of a year. So 1,000 cubits speaks of 1,000 years. Verse 4. And he measured a thousand and brought me forth through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand, brought me through. The waters were to the loins. So God's been moving reaching every generation, thousands of years. Verse 5, And afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And in the natural, if we stand in a river only up to our ankles, we are in control. The same as if we are knee deep or loin deep, we're in control. However, if we are in deep water, the river has control and we need to flow with the river. And God desires every believer to trust him and to flow with his plan. And verses 6 and 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the water. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on the one side and on the other. There were many trees on each side of the river. In verse 8, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, 
and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. Well, we said earlier that water speak of nations, people. When the river flows in a desert place or even to the sea, the river will bring life and healing. Wherever the river flows, it will bring life and healing. Verse 9 and 10. And it shall come to pass that everything that lives, which moves whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river comes. And it shall come to pass that the fishes shall stand upon it from Engedi to Englium, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets, their fish shall be according to their kinds and the fish of the great sea exceeding many. Spiritually, fish speak of people because Jesus said to Peter and Andrew that he would make them fishes of men. And also Jesus said the fields are white to harvest. Hallelujah. And then we read a warning in verse 11. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed they shall be given to salt. When a river does not flow into miry places or marsh places, there's no life or healing. And spiritually, churches need to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to come into the meetings so life and healing can be imparted to the people. Verse 12 and by the river on the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because these waters, their waters, they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine." Again, believers are likened to trees and the trees were planted on either side of the river and they're going to bring forth new fruit. Hallelujah. And also, we just read the leaf was for medicine, for healing. You know, and if we're likened to trees, our arm would be like the branch and our hands would be like the leaves at the end of the branch, which brings healing. And Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 18, that the believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. The leaves are for the healing. Praise God. Praise God. The sick shall recover. Hallelujah. And meanwhile, everywhere the river flows, it brings life. And the Jordan River eventually flows into the Dead Sea. And the people of the world are spiritually dead. And God desires to use you and every believer to bring his life to them so their lives can be healed. Praise God. And so where is the river? As believers, the river's in you and me. It's in our belly. He's in there. Everywhere we go, the workplace, the shopping center, uh, on the train, wherever we go, we're to bring life. And so in summary, the Jordan River, what does it do? It brings life. It brings healing to lives. It causes us to die to our old ways. It separates ourself, us from ungodly things. It's a place of preparation as we get tumbled around, tested and tried. It's a place of separation, even a separation into ministry. And it causes us to bring forth much fruit. So spiritually, what is the Jordan River? It is God's word, the Bible, by the Holy Spirit. And it causes death to self and God's life to be revealed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in summary, with God's help, let us not be like the 50 sons of the prophets who stood afar off and only watched what God was going to do. Rather, may we press in and allow the Jordan River, God's word, to deal with our heart so we'll be fruitful part of the end time church and 
and in the marriage of the Lamb. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.